You're listening to Ret Read Podcast. I'm Anna. I'm Serge. And we're here to talk about books we've read. Hope you enjoy! Hey, Anna! Hey, Serge! How's it going? It's going great. Starting yet another episode of the exciting Red Read Podcast. Before we start, I just want to give a shout out to at Grey Shadows on Twitter. You won our first giveaway. Yeah, congratulations. Also, you did quite well on the answers to our questions, so congrats on that. You must be like a trivia buff. Fear not those who didn't win. There are more giveaways, including the one that's posted already. There's going to be three more chances this month. Keep those entries coming. Before we get into the Fear Street book, we actually both read a book recently. Meddling Kids by Edgar Contero. I was a little bit skeptical going into this book to begin with, but I ended up loving it. I think it's probably my favorite book of the year so far. I heard about it on NPR and I was really interested, but it didn't meet my good reads ratings standard that I usually go by but because I was so intrigued by the synopsis of the book and what I had read I decided that this would be a good book for us to check out for the podcast. This author did something interesting. The book is a little bit like a Scooby-Doo fan fiction in that the characters and some of the plot especially the backstory seem to be based on the Scooby-Doo cartoon show. If you've ever seen an episode of Scooby-Doo you know where meddling kids comes from. I would have gotten away with it if it weren't for those meddling kids and their dog. Yeah, and that's a quote from the backstory. Without any spoilers here, I can say that. Also, the writing style has some stage direction and camera angles. You could almost see it be an episode of a show. Yeah, it's H.P. Lovecraft meets Scooby-Doo. The overall plot has a lot of, as Anna mentioned, H.P. Lovecraft, Cthulhu-type pulp horror themes brought in. That really lends an air of seriousness because you begin to realize that at the end there's not going to be an unmasking where it turns out that the monster was fake. The monster is real and it brings a real sense of danger to the story. The basic premise of the book is the crime-solving gang. They're in their 20s. Their heyday of crime-solving is behind them. They've all gone their different ways, but life hasn't panned out the way that they would have thought it would have. And there's this one case that's still nagging at every single one of them. They need to go back to Blighton Hills to finish up this one crime that they feel there are too many loose ends. And you're just following them, kind of, in a way, reliving their childhood, but in another way, becoming the adults that they desperately really wanted to be and getting rid of the demons that have bothered them in the 10 years since they've last seen each other. I gave this thing a 5 on Goodreads and it really blew me away and the reason for that was in large part due to the writing style. I'm a big fan of Douglas Adams. If you don't know Douglas Adams, he's a sci-fi author who wrote kind of a comedic sci-fi series called Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I really loved it. The humor is quirky and fun and this is similar to the humor style in this book but the writing style here is also a lot more vivid and descriptive and I would say even meticulous in its usage of words and phrasing but at the same time with all of that it's also very carefree. It feels like the author is really unburdened with worrying about what the reader thinks because he's already gotten all of that out of the way by making this a Scooby-Doo fan fiction essentially. The author is saying listen I don't care. You can't take this book too seriously. Well it's a Scooby-Doo satire I would say. It's not a fanfic because it is a novel that can stand on its own rights. You don't have to have ever watched an episode of Scooby-Doo to enjoy this book. It feels like it took the author a lot of effort to craft this book and put it all together with care and precision. And what I've seen before is, for example, an author like Joe Hill will start off with the intention to do so. He wants his book to be a well-crafted masterpiece. And so for a book like, for example, Nosferatu, he comes in and the first half the book, you can see the effort the multiple drafts that must have gone into it it's very well polished and then by the end of the book you can tell that the author is getting tired of the story and he's just getting just slipshod misspellings random errors run-on sentences plot holes the whole thing starts unraveling that happens in, in books sometimes sometimes the author comes in with really high hopes and just falls short in this book the quality is consistent throughout the jokes keep coming punchlines are set up dozens of pages, hundreds of pages beforehand. Everything is well connected. All the loose ends are tied up and everything works. This book is firing on all cylinders 
full steam ahead. Just no downside for me whatsoever. I do agree with that. I do think that the beginning and the end, it's pretty consistent. It does lag in action for a little bit in the middle. There are some character moments as opposed to the nonstop action that's been happening. It does add to the book, but I do think it slowed it down just a tiny bit, but he ramps it up pretty quickly. And the entire climax to the end is just a rollicking good time. One thing that you need to watch out for here is that this book did get a lot of mixed reviews. Anna and I both really liked it, but there were a lot of people out there who didn't enjoy it. It didn't meet the expectation that they had coming in. And so perhaps if you are interested in picking this book up, check out the Goodreads reviews, see what other people think. Personally, this book is amazing. Just the writing and the language are so beautiful. We did listen to this via audiobook, and I have to say the narrator did an incredible job. She was able to become every character and gave each character a unique little twist as well as be a good narrator and I feel like her style fit with the writing but I do have to say that when I was listening to the book I was thinking about how it would come off in the written page and whether or not I would enjoy reading it as much as I enjoyed listening to it and I have to say I'm not entirely sure maybe this is a book that lends itself well to being performed as opposed to being read you know as you said earlier that this was almost cinematic and how it came off to you while listening to it, perhaps reading it, it can get a little tedious. Like you said, the Goodreads reviews sort of reflect that, where I feel like a lot of people had read the book and there are a lot of did not finishes and they just couldn't get through it because of the writing style itself. If you pick up the book and you don't like reading it, try listening to the audiobook because we listened to it and just really fell in love with it. It was so well performed, the story was interesting, and the narrator does a fantastic job. And thank you to our local public library for providing this audiobook. If you guys don't want to pay for an audiobook, check out your local public library. They might have this available for you. The good thing about local libraries is that a lot of local libraries are are subscribed to Overdrive, which is just an app on your phone that you can download pretty quickly. It works for Android and Apple. I know our library, if they don't have a specific audiobook available to you, you can actually request it and they could just order it for you. Yeah, it's a win-win situation for everybody. I can definitely vouch for this book on audiobook. Five stars for the audiobook. This is hands down the best narration I have ever heard on any audiobook. I haven't listened to that many audiobooks, just a few here and there. But this one just blew me away. Such a fantastic job. I have to agree. I gave this book 4.5 stars out of 5, which rounds to 5. If I wanted to judge the reader on her own, she is definitely 5 out of 5. She made this book for me. I've listened to a lot of audiobooks in my time and I have to say she's probably one of my favorite readers. I'd have to say I'd give her six out of five. So the narrator for the audiobook is Kyla Garcia and we cannot stress enough how good she was and how good an experience this book was for us because of her narration. Thank you very much to Kyla Garcia and also to the author of the book. Edgar Cantero. It was a wonderful experience for the both of us. So after the intermission we're going to talk about Fear Street Cheerleaders, The First Evil. Tigers roar, tigers growl, we want a touchdown, now, now, now. For a series of books that's been about nothing but high school stuff, why not take a look at one of the bigger aspects of high school, the whole pep thing, right guys? So let's get into the prediction accuracy. I don't think any of you guys are going to be surprised when you find out that, once again, I completely bombed on the accuracy. I don't know what's with me. I keep trying to get this thing right, and... Eh... Anna, why don't you go first? I said that some girls are trying out to be cheerleaders, which, yes. And then I said some of the girls got waitlisted and are mad about it. They weren't waitlisted, they were sort of downgraded, so that's kind of right, kind of wrong. Also, I want to point out that you said there would be tryouts, and it's not really... I want to nitpick, it's not a complete tryouts, right? I mean, it's just... But they are trying There's out. two girls trying out, but it's not tryouts. But it's a tryout. Can I just have this one small victory? No. (sighs) I said that bad things would start happening to people that made the team. True. I said the weapon would be witchcraft, which we don't (sighs) know if that's inaccurate. I think it 
Could be true, yeah. I said that it was a female victim and a female murderer. Yep. And also, I do want to say that if you've seen Buffy the Vampire Slayer Season 1, Episode 3, which I did steal that entire plot line for my prediction, except the part about the end in that episode, but I'm not going to spoil the episode because it's a great episode. So I said it would definitely not be a tryout. No tryout whatsoever. And of course, eh... I mean, it wasn't a complete tryout, but two people tried out. It's kind of a tryout. Anyway, and then I said the juniors and seniors on the squad were going to be hazing the new members, but it goes all wrong. And that's not entirely accurate. That was pretty far off. But that's not even how hazing works. It's not by what grade you're in. Yeah. The next thing I predicted is that the weapon is the pom-pom. A girl will be suffocated with it. And yeah, nothing could be further from the truth. The pom-pom did not figure in any way in anybody's death. The death was not by suffocation whatsoever. Actually, it was, can I just say, the most gruesome death, I think, so far. It was pretty awful. Just because it would probably been more protracted. So, anyway, I'm basically completely wrong, and Anna is pretty much mostly right, as per usual. So, let's get into the plot synopsis. So, we got some spoilery chapter titles. This happens every time he's got the chapter titles instead of the numbers. You know what's going to happen in the chapter. Except for that one book, right? There was one. I think it was first date we said it wasn't as bad. I think we would fail our own giveaway trivia. Yeah. (laughs) The book has multiple points of views, which is actually pretty different. It flashes through different members of the cheerleading squad at Shadyside High, not just the people you start with or the antagonists, which you've seen in other books. Halloween Party also sort of had this to a degree where it would go between three different characters, but this book goes between, I think, all of the cheerleaders at some point, except the two that don't really matter. They just exist. The Corcorans just moved to Fear Street from Missouri. Bobby and Corky Corin were top cheerleaders at their old school, so they obviously want to join the cheerleading team at Shady Side High, which is reasonable, I think. They're actually super impressive and make the team, but since people get removed from the team to make room for them, it rubs a lot of cheerleaders the wrong way. Yeah, actually, even before they try out, a lot of the cheerleaders are against it because tryouts were actually the previous spring, and it seems unfair that these kids that just moved in get to try out even though they missed the cutoff. You're just trying to get rid of my prediction accuracy points, aren't you? (laughs) Uh, Listen, I'm just saying it how it is. Several awful accidents later, was making the team really something to cheer about? Uh, I see what you did there. All right, guys, let's talk about the characters. We start with Bobby Kokorin. She's 17 years old. She has green eyes, high cheekbones, creamy white skin, blonde hair that's very light and fine. She has a full figure and a sarcastic sense of humor. By the way, that's Bobby spelled with a B-O-B-B-I. That's very, um, British. Or I should say the British Isles. Yeah, that's right. That's a British Isles thing. But, you know, that's cool. You have her sister Corky, who's 16. She's called Cork by Bobby. I'm not entirely sure that's a great nickname. Yeah, that's really actually really funny because Cork is like a county in Ireland. Corcoran is an Irish last name. And Bobby could be an Irish name as well. So maybe they're just trying to be close to their roots. Well, Cork doesn't whine about it. Oh, <laughs> She's also described as having green eyes, high cheekbones, creamy white skin, blonde hair that's very light and fine. They look like twins to a degree, except the fact that Corky is two inches taller than her sister, and she's a little more boyish looking. They actually share a room with each other. They do share a room, and they're actually, they seem to be pretty close. They really have a good rapport with each other, despite the age difference. One other thing about them, we mentioned earlier in the plot synopsis that they were good in the tryouts. They were actually really good on their old squad back home in Missouri. Their team went all state and actually went to the National ESPN Cheerleading Championship and they basically led their team to victory. That is actually super impressive. But you know who's not impressed by this? Sean, their little brother, who's a little bit bratty. He kind of hates everything about them. He trash talks them all the time. When they're about to go off to their cheerleading (laughs) thing, he says, well, you suck. You're not going to make the team. Shady High sucks. They're not going to win. Blah, blah, blah. I think he's going through a phase. Also, I think at his age it's tough to move around. He probably has a bunch of friends back home in Missouri that he misses and now he's forced to move over here. He's jealous that his sisters are going to be able to fit in with their cheerleading and he probably feels like he doesn't have that kind of thing going on. And also, Bobby and Corky, they're only one year apart and they're actually super close. Sean doesn't really fit in with his sister, so that's kind of 
uncomfortable for him as well. Yeah. You feel bad for him, but also, he's actually not that broken up about it. He's kind of... Off in his own little world. Yeah. You have their parents. The only description you have for their dad is that he's handsome and young looking, but he is pretty sarcastic with his kids and they make jokes at their mother's expense. The description for the mother is kind of weird. Arl Stein says that mom is a pale reflection of the vibrant young daughters. That's kind of weird. Yeah, I don't get where he's going with that. It could even be like kind of offensive. I'm not sure. Let's maybe just leave that one alone and say that she kind of looks like her daughters. So blonde hair. One last thing I want to mention. This family just has a great dynamic and they really just seem to get along. There's like some joking and some friendly pranks going on. But overall, they're a really great family unit. One of the best family units we've seen so far in this series. Yeah, I really liked how they supported each other and they were there for each other. It was good to see. One of the characters is really pissed off that these sisters are quote unquote all American girls. That's used as a put down by that character. But actually, if you look at this family, this is like the all American family. I'm just going to go ahead and say it. I think all they're missing is a dog. Do they have a dog? That breakfast scene is so classic. It could be an episode on horsing around or something. The average American family has what, two and a half kids? Yep. They do achieve that. But we're not going to talk about that sort of hostile cheerleader yet. We'll talk about Jennifer Daly, who's actually cheer captain. She looks just like Julia Roberts with large, dark eyes and sensual full lips. And if you've seen a picture of Julia Roberts, you know what that means. Oh my god, here Arl Stein goes again with the actor references. She's tall and slender and moves with an easy grace. She's a friendly girl with a soft voice and a high tinkling laugh as she lives in the North Hills. But we do have an assistant and captain of the cheerleading team. And she is Kimi Bass, or is it Bass? I don't know. I never know how to pronounce that because it depends, like, if you're talking about the instrument or the fish. Anyway, she has a round face topped by a mop of crimped black hair, full cheeks that always seem to be pink. And she's described, Arl Stein's words, not mine, as having a slightly chunky shape. And she's loud, enthusiastic, and so full of energy that she seems to be unable to stand still. Her parents gave her a silver megaphone pendant for her for her 16th birthday and the clasp seems to be broken because it keeps on falling off and she keeps saying oh I need to have this repaired and she hates the Corcorans. Yeah she's the one that doesn't like their all American good looks because she's a little bit self conscious of you know she's not the most traditionally beautiful looking of the cheerleading squad but she makes up for that with her energy pep and school spirit. She's one of the most talented members on the squad and she's really energetic. I think she just feels a little bit threatened by these new people coming in. She's got big fish little pond syndrome, except bigger fish are coming in. I think that's pretty accurate. She doesn't see that actually a rising tide will float all boats. She could actually learn a lot from the sisters coming in and actually become better herself. And that's what Jennifer Daly keeps saying to Kimmy. We need them on the team so they can teach us all the new tricks and maybe we'll make Allstate. Maybe we'll make it on ESPN. Wouldn't it be great? And Kimmy's just like, no. Exactly. Kimmy, it seems, would rather be be the number two person on the squad and be kind of crappy than be an amazing cheerleader but be number three or four on the squad. She's still the assistant captain regardless of the Corcoran so even if she's not talent wise one, two, or even three ranking wise she was still number two. Yeah this is what leadership is all about. This is kind of what you're supposed to learn or what you could learn in high school if you're on a sports team or in a club. What you can do is you can actually learn how to become a good leader. For example, in in the cheerleading squad, as the vice captain, she's supposed to be training up her leadership skills. This is a kind of a teachable moment where she's supposed to recognize that she can still be a good leader without being the most talented or the best person on the squad. Unfortunately for her, the Kokorans are just so nice and friendly and smile so much that she could not see beyond how kind they were and just hated them. (laughs) Because kindness breeds more anger in her. I don't know where this bitterness is rooted in her, but maybe we'll find out more in the next cheerleader book. Next up we have Veronica Mitchell, also known as Ronnie. She's the only freshman to have made the squad, but she was bumped from the team when Corky and Bobby joined because budget. She has curly red hair, small brown eyes, 
a tiny round stub of a nose and a face full of freckles. She's also a little bit angry, but not to the extent that Kimmy is. And she also doesn't really blame the Kirkorans as much as she blames the advisor for the club, as well as the captain of the club, Jennifer. She also has a best friend on the team, Deborah Kern, who is described as beautiful but cold looking, with straight blonde hair cut very short with icy blue eyes. She's short and thin, almost too thin, which seems like kind of a rude judgment to make, but whatever. And she smiles very seldomly. One is chunky, but then the other one's too thin. One is too tall. One is a pale reflection of the children. It's kind of a weird book description-wise, I think. I feel like it's one of those things that doesn't really fit in today's society because there are other ways to describe someone that aren't chunky or too thin or... It's weird. Yeah. I don't know if he's done this in previous books. Is this supposed to be some kind of like commentary on the whole idea of cheerleaders? If you look at the adjectives he's used or the way he's described people, it has almost a negative connotation to everything, which is kind of odd for him because even in First Date, the murderer sees the main character as a chubby girl, but nowhere in the description of her description does she come off and say like, oh, I'm chubby, I'm fat, blah, blah, blah. It's immoral more coded in a way, I'd say. Whereas this just comes out and says, well, this person's just too skinny. That's a very odd judgment to make. This book is a little bit dated in its character descriptions, but maybe in a sense it's a little bit prescient because everybody on this cheerleading squad is female, and that's pretty common for high school cheerleading squads, I think. And the uniforms are, they do tend to be a little bit revealing and a little bit objectification of the female, you know, physique. Maybe he's trying to make a commentary on it, maybe it's just a subconscious thing on his his part, but the descriptions do come off that way. We do have two remaining cheerleaders on this team. We have Megan Carmen and her best friend Heather Dial. The two of them are always together, however, they don't seem to have any lines in this book. They do have one or two lines in this book. They're relatively insignificant. You do have Miss Green, who's the PE and health teacher, and she's also in charge of the cheerleaders. She's described as being compact with frizzy brown hair, a plain face that naturally falls into an angry expression. She has a husky voice that always sounds like she has a bad case of laryngitis, and she has a well-deserved reputation for being tough. And you can see that, but she also does recognize talent when it shows up, so when she sees the Krakorans, her mind is blown. Yeah, she wants another trophy on her trophy shelf. Finally, let's get on to the male characters in the book. We have Charles Chip Chastner. He's the captain and quarterback of the football team. He was actually dating Kimmy for the last two years, until about two weeks ago. Now he might be on the lookout for someone new. Next up we have Simmons. He's one of Shadyside High's custodians and bus drivers. That's an interesting combo. Mm -hmm. Do schools combo jobs like that? They could if they had like a really low budget, but I thought we already established that Shady Sai had had quite a high budget, what with the Outdoor Adventure Club and all the other activities that they make available for their students. So it seems kind of weird that they would have to like pile up things like this. He's a laid back young man with a blonde ponytail and Walkman headphones permanently glued to his ears and he is not dependable at either one of his jobs. He sounds kind of like that Simpsons character, the bus driver. So let's get into the in-depth plot. Yes, let's do that. So the book starts with that Kokoran family breakfast that you talked about and how it's just adorable. Corky and Bobby play this trick on Sean. They put a fake rat in front of his door and he's terrified of rats and they have a giggle. They go down and their moms made them poached eggs and she's super excited like, you need proteins for your tryouts and you're going to make the team. You're the best. I'm so proud of you. And And then all the kids make fun of the poached eggs. These eggs are awful. Why do we have to have eggs? Ugh, what did this come from? Looks like rat vomit. Sean is screaming upstairs because he saw the rat. The girls are laughing. He comes down, he throws on the table. The mom's like, get that off the table. And and he looks at the eggs and, ugh, that's the rat vomit. And the dad laughing and like, yup, these eggs are awful. And she's just like, I love you all. You girls are going to do so well. And Sean's like, no, you guys suck. It's a great family moment, like you said. But that happiness sort of comes to an end when you start the next chapter. By the way, this first section of the book is called The Cheers. 
Yeah, this book is actually divided into three sections, and we start with the cheers, as you said. Yes. After the family scene, you switch over to the point of view of the cheerleading squad. There's a huge debate about whether or not the Kerkoran sisters should be allowed to try out. Now, Kimmy's arguing that tryouts are usually held in the spring. Why are we even letting them have a chance? And the team has practiced together all summer long. They've all team building, der der der, built a rapport together. So it's totally unfair, totally uncomfortable called for should not happen and Deborah agrees and is really mouthy about it and verbal and says like yeah it's not cool yeah they're like well is this gonna set a new precedent are we gonna have a tryout every week every time someone wants to join the team how can we allow this to happen and Jennifer's just like you know what these girls are so good they brought their team to states they went to the ESPN national thing I want to be on ESPN I want to make nationals like what is going on yeah and it's not unfair because these kids just transferred in how are they supposed supposed to try out last spring they didn't know their parents were gonna move to shady side so miss green says you know what cheer captain makes the decision we already know where jennifer stands on this so yeah they try out they try out and their routine amazes everyone except kimmy and deborah who stand stone-faced but i bet inside they're impressed they're just jelly they're super jelly they're so jelly so obviously the kokorans make the team miss green is salivating at the thought of having these espn all-stars on her squad but the thing is there aren't enough spots for everyone because of funding see the squad only normally has six people and they can squeeze in one more but they can't have eight people apparently that's how funding works even though they have to speed rush two uniforms for the Kokoran sisters and all the other girls already have uniforms so we can talk about this in nitpicks what happens is Ronnie as the freshman is naturally downgraded to alternate and she can sub in whenever one of the other girls gets sick or can't make the game or whatever but she can go to every single practice and every game and every single pep rally that happens and she has a uniform already yeah so to all intents and purposes she's on the squad she just doesn't get to go and perform in front of everybody she almost collapses when she's told this and she has to brush back these angry tears and she's just so angry at Jennifer for letting them try out out and Miss Green, how dare she do that? And Deborah's just like, you know what? It's the Corcorans. They're so phony. And you know what? Jennifer, she's got this big head for being captain. And Kimmy says, you know what? Jennifer used to be my friend. I don't even know what's wrong with her. She's just so uppity now. I don't even get it. But the Corcorans are awful and they don't deserve to make the team. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're obviously all jealous. I kind of get where Ronnie's coming from. It must really suck to get cut from the team. She was probably really excited to make the team as a freshman and to practice with everybody all summer. So I get that she's crying and she's angry. That's relatable, actually. The other girls are just not nice. They're not being reasonable. Well, I can see Deborah just trying to take Ronnie's side because they are best friends, but... Don't is- blame the Corcorans. Two weeks later... It's the first away game. It's a super rainy night. Unpredictable wind gusts. And Simmons, as we said, is just not good at his job. He's driving super fast through this. Suddenly, Corky realizes that she forgot the fire batons back at her house. They need that for their fire baton routine at the game. So they gotta stop by Fear Street on the way to the game. So Jennifer's giving announcements in the aisle of the bus. And she just looks at Simmons and says, We need to go to Fear Street. So they make their way through shady side they get on fear street the windshield is fogging up so simmons does the reasonable thing and opens the door of the bus so he can look out the side door and keep driving forward and obviously the bus skids crashes and flips and jennifer who was standing in the aisle this entire time jennifer is thrown out the door that simmons opened to see out the side because the front was fogged up and all the kids are screaming there's confusion finally it comes to a stop the girls climb out the bus windows find that the bus has careened off the road and slid on the Fear Street Cemetery grass and they're in the middle of the cemetery. And they're trying to do a head count. Like, are we all here? Are we all here? And they realize Jennifer's not here. So they sort of look around and they see Jennifer and she's face down with her head resting on the earth in front of a tombstone for Sarah Fear, 1875 to 1899. And then Bobby runs over and she checks Jennifer's vitals. She can't sense any vital signs. She says, Jennifer's dead. Within seconds, three Three ambulances and a police cruiser arrive and they think maybe someone who lives around here called the police, you know, in one of these abandoned homes nearby. One of the paramedics declares Jennifer dead after the paramedics stand around her for a while and sort of murmur to each other. As the paramedics have kind of given up hope, they're basically just loading the corpse onto the ambulance. Bobby realizes that actually Jennifer might be alive because she sees eye 
blinking. Finally, Jennifer opens her eyes. She blinks. Her lips tremble. Her eyes move from side to side. And she says, hey. And the paramedics are like, oh. Oh, yeah, no. I mean, yeah, she's, yeah, let's take her to the hospital. Yeah, we gotta treat her. And then Ronnie and Heather argue about whether they should go to the game or go home. And Kimmy just says to the Kokorans, this is your fault. This is your fault this happened. This is your fault. That's good leadership right there. Yeah, Kimmy still hasn't figured it out. Here we go. This is the next section of the book now. It's called The Fall. And this is not at all anticipating the events in this section. It's two weeks later, right? And it's another pep rally. And the cheerleaders are debuting their new uniforms because their old ones got ruined in the crash, obviously. Kimmy expects to be named cheer captain. So Jennifer wheels herself in. She's paralyzed from the crash, but she's actually still wearing one of the new uniforms because they got her one. She thanks everybody for the support that she got. She got a lot of cards and gifts and flowers. And so she gives a short speech at the pep rally. But Ronnie gets to be on the team now. So there's that. Yeah, so Ronnie's happy. And then Miss Green comes out and she is going to announce the new cheer captain before their next cheer routine. And Kimmy is ready to stand up. Yeah, so this first chapter of this section is from her point of view. So you see her whole thought process and then it all comes crashing down. Who's the new cheer captain? Bobby! They're about to start their new routine and Kimmy just thinks that everyone is staring at her and judging her and talking about her and she basically kind of breaks down and runs away. And then the other cheerleaders just kind of like merge in to close the gap where she would have been and go on with their routine without Kimmy. And now Bobby becomes super popular. She's hit on by Star QB Chip aka Kimmy's ex. Yeah, he actually asked her out and she she says yes. Not knowing, by the way, that he was dating Kimmy earlier. Later that night, Bobby goes to hang out with Jennifer because they've actually become really good friends in the meantime. Jennifer tells her that, yeah, I had to talk with Kimmy and I convinced her to join the cheerleaders. Watch out though, because Jennifer might be trying to turn the girls, like Ronnie and Deborah, who already hate the Kokorans, against you, so... So then Bobby tells Jennifer about Chip. She's kind of excited, you know, being asked out by one of the more attractive guys at school star of the football team, captain and quarterback, like, woo! And Jennifer just gets really upset. Tells her that, you know, Chip and Kimmy have been dating for the past two years or so. Kimmy might not be happy with you dating him. I think she also mentions that she kind of had a thing for him, but Well, she actually talks about how attractive he is because Bobby asks, well, what should I do? And Jennifer goes, well, he's really attractive. Very helpful. The next cheer practice they have actually goes really poorly because Kimmy has such a shitty attitude that is rubbing off on everyone. Bobby is not able to be an effective leader because Kimmy's kind of like souring the whole squad against her so they're not really following her orders very well and they're kind of giving her sass. As vice captain, Kimmy should really not be doing that. Anyway, after practice, Bobby goes to get her stuff from her locker and she's dwelling on how badly the practice went. She's wondering what she can do to get everybody to listen to her to become recognized as the true captain of the squad. She's feeling down. She gets to her locker and suddenly this weird thing happens where the locker starts slamming open and shut and then all of the lockers all the way up and down the hall start opening and shutting loudly and she hears a high-pitched shrill scream of anguish and pain. She runs to see what's going on but there's nobody there and suddenly everything goes quiet. It's very strange. But then we go to the game against Winstead High and the cheerleaders are doing well. Bobby's taking note that, you know, the practice might not have gone well and the girls might hate her, but when the time comes and they need to perform at the game, everyone is just cheering loudly, cheering proudly, going all out with R.L. Stein's really crappy cheerleading cheers. Rah, rah, rah. Go, go, go. Go, 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 go. go it's inspiring. Go, go. During the game, when Chip was trying to throw the ball, instead he would stand there like a statue. He would get sacked over and over again. It's during a particular series... And he ends up going three and out. And basically every single time he's frozen and he gets sacked like three times in a row. And on the third sack, he has to get taken out of the game because he's not even moving. Once he hits the ground, he's just not moving. And everyone's a little bit like, whoa, what just happened? Well, they actually start booing him, which you don't actually do when someone looks like they're injured. But the back 
backup quarterback comes in, he's no good, and Shadyside loses 21-6. So since Bobby has sort of a thing for Chip, she stays after to try to catch him after the game, and they have a talk, and Chip tells her that he felt a little spacey, like he was dead, and he was paralyzed, he couldn't move. Then he gets kind of really angry and defensive. He told her that he was scared. It's like a mixture of like, he doesn't want to seem to be vulnerable, he doesn't want to reveal like the things that he's afraid of, but at the same time he does need to share it with somebody and I guess he might as well share it with her in the end they end up making out in the car at the next practice Kimmy goes after Bobby and she says you know we're still together me and Chip I don't know what you've heard Bobby goes you know what he came after me so you need to get your own facts straight and that Kimmy just goes off they get in that a massive quote unquote cat fight yeah they there's are, like hair grabbing I think grabbing each other scratching each other it's pretty violent actually it's mostly from Kimmy but Miss Green walks in right when it looks like it's pretty much both of them going at each other and really Bobby's just trying to defend herself. She forces them to apologize to each other or face suspension. Kimmy says no way and Bobby sort of becomes the first one that goes you know what I want to apologize and Kimmy just grudgingly agrees even though you know Kimmy wants to apologize too because she doesn't want to get kicked off the team. They apologize and they want to try out this new routine that Corky invented for state finals the previous year back in Missouri and it's actually a huge trust experiment between Bobby and Kimmy. Kimmy needs to jump off Corky's shoulders and Bobby needs to catch her. So Corky, Bobby, and Miss Green actually demonstrate this first and Kimmy's like, okay, let's try it. You see this coming, right? You see this coming, you go like, oh, it's all set up already and you go like, no, Bobby, don't do this. Kimmy, no, don't. And you can't stop it. Kimmy launches from Corky's shoulders and Bobby's frozen. She can't move. She wants to catch Kimmy and like all the thoughts race through her head she's frozen from the moment the routine starts and she's like trying to mentally will Kimmy to not jump but yeah Kimmy jumps and no one's there to catch her she slams onto the ground there's a crack her head slams and bounces back everyone's frozen for a second no one knows what to do and then just pandemonium Deborah and Ronnie accuse Bobby of doing this on purpose Megan and Heather run out to call 911 and Bobby's just screaming no 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 I didn't do it no 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 please and she runs out of the school just as the paramedics come running in and she runs into Chip. Miss Green saw the whole thing. Everybody saw the entire thing and the way it looks is Bobby's just standing there doing nothing. Makes no effort whatsoever to catch Kimmy and that's all there is to it. So Bobby runs into Chip and Chip says he's going to see a doctor for his weird paralysis issue and she tells him that OMG same thing just happened to me. I know exactly what you're talking about. What's going on? He says I'll call you later. Yeah you might have the same thing. Yeah you should just go see a doctor too and that's that. So Bobby's hanging out with Jennifer later that night you know Jennifer comes to practice every day with her wheelchair you know she has that cheerleader outfit she has that cheerleader pennant she has the palms but she's sort of like an honorary cheerleader at this time so she saw what happened she she knows what's going on and as Bobby's telling her about meeting up with Chip Jennifer has this sort of reaction it's not a good reaction but she reacts and she tells Bobby that Kimmy has a broken wrist and she tries to cheer Bobby up the entire night try to change to different subjects talk about homework, talk about anything. No matter what Jennifer tries, Bobby just can't stop thinking about letting Kimmy down and how Kimmy fell. She keeps flashing back to that moment. It must have been really traumatic for her. She keeps hearing the sound of Kimmy's wrist breaking in her head and she can't focus on anything else, no matter how much Jennifer tries to distract her. So Bobby finally decides to call it a night and wants to head home. As Bobby's heading out and getting in her car, she sees a shadow walking back and forth in Jennifer's house. And Jennifer Jennifer's parents aren't in. So she's like, that must be Jennifer. But she's paralyzed. Did she suddenly have a revelation that she can walk? I should go and check on her and share this moment of happiness with her. So when Bobby knocks on the door, there's a small pause and then Jennifer opens the door and she's in a wheelchair. And Bobby's like, huh? I must have been mistaken. What's going on? So Bobby tries to play it off. You know what? I thought I left my gloves in the house, but I actually didn't have any gloves. And Jennifer's like, wow, you seem to be really messed up. Just go home. So Bobby goes home and she goes straight to Corky and tells Corky what she saw. And Corky's like, maybe it's time that you go see a doctor. And Bobby does not appreciate the insinuation. So they have a sister fight. Yep, they have a sister fight. And then you have, uh, you get a little bit of a... Joe Hill level foreshadowing. 
it's really sad what's about to happen. Corky might have been more sympathetic. She might have been more understanding, more caring, more believing. But Corky had no way of knowing that this was the last night she would ever spend with her sister. On that really heartbreaking note, we get to the third act of the book, The Evil. So we're at the next cheerleading practice and Bobby's trying to hype up the team and at this point, no one is listening to her. Morale is, you know, scraping the bottom of the barrel. You went through the barrel, into the ground, dug all the way down because no one is reacting to anything. They want nothing to do with what she's saying. And Corky's not there because she had to finish her science lab, so there's no one on her side. So Ms. Green cancels practice, sends everybody home, but Bobby has to stay behind. And basically, she kicks Bobby off the team and tells her, hey, you're lucky, you know, I'm not pressing charges, kid. Flies she there. says that the squad has lost confidence in her and maybe she should go talk to someone about what's happening. Yeah, well, basically, she thinks that Bobby's like a psycho bitch. But you know what? This is so freaking unfair to Bobby. It is so unfair. Like, everybody was, like, just shitting all over her from the very beginning. Ms. Green gave her no support. She just kind of, like, wanted to exploit her for the freaking trophy. It's total BS. Bobby doesn't take this news well, and she decides that she's going to take a shower to just sort of wash the day away. And as she's in the shower, she starts hearing these weird things, and she shrugs it off. She gets into the shower. The doors close behind her. She's like, what is going on? Maybe someone else is here. I don't know. So she turns the shower on, and it's scalding hot. She can't change the temperature, and she's freaking out. And then all the showers turn on, and they're equally hot. The drain seems to be plugged. The water's not going anywhere. She's trying to open the door. The door's locked. There's nowhere to escape the scalding hot water and she's just burning. Yeah, even though the door doesn't have a lock on it, it's just one of those swinging shower doors that just kind of snaps into place. There's no reason it should be locked or closed or to be unable to be opened. This is probably the most gruesome death scene in all of Fear Street because in Lights Out, you have the main camp counselor who died in a very terrible way. However, you don't get that death from her point of view, right? You don't see through her eyes how she died. In this scene, you see through Bobby's eyes. You hear the thoughts in her head, the final thoughts in her head as she's dying this horrible, painful death. And it's really messed up. It's dramatic. Well, you have her trying to escape. You get to read how the boiling water is burning her, how the steam is making it so difficult to breathe. And every her feet are being burned because the drains are plugged and the water's not draining anywhere. And she's just being hit in all sides from the water. No matter what she does, she just can't open the door. It's a really messed up scene. Later, Corky comes in, finds the gym empty because she was in the science lab. She doesn't know that Miss Green sent everyone home. And she looks around the gym and she sees that everything's back where it should be so maybe practice ended early so she goes to check out the locker room to see if there's anyone there and she hears the shower on she finds Kimmy's pendant necklace on the ground and she sees Bobby's clothing on the bench so she figures you know I'm gonna pocket the necklace and give it to Kimmy the next time I see her and I'll go say hi to Bobby in the shower because we had that fight last night and I really want to apologize so she opens the shower door and a bunch of water just gushes out she looks down and saw Bobby lying face down against the wall under the shower heads. Bobby? Through gaps in the parting fog, her body slowly became visible. Her arms were crumpled beneath her. Her legs were folded. Her hair was soaked and matted over her head and onto the floor. Her back, her legs, her skin, her entire body was as red as a lobster. Bobby? Gripped with fear, Corky plunged into the room, dropped to her knees in the scalding water. Bobby? With a loud gasp, she reached down and pulled her sister's head up by the hair. Bobby? Bobby? Please? Bobby stared back at her with vacant, wide-eyed terror, her flesh swollen and red, her mouth locked open in a silent scream. Bobby? No, no answer. The heavy steam settled over Corky, making her shiver. Holding her sister tightly in her arms, Corky knew that Bobby would never answer her again. Yeah, so this is brutal. Not only does Bobby die this awful death, you now have Corky who got and just, you know, the normal kind of sister fight you might have, but she never gets the chance to apologize because Bobby's dead and not only that, she's actually the one to find the dead body. This is just really, really tragic. It's a few weeks later and Corky goes to visit Bobby's grave just to talk. Bobby's buried in the new section that's up a hill and away from the street. The other cheerleaders and Chip were at the funeral, and Corky 
Corky just tells her, Kimmy is cheer captain, but I don't even care. This doesn't even matter to me. I just, I wish you were here. I want to do this with you. She says that the police said that Bobby had a seizure and died instantly, but you know, Bobby, you were so healthy. How can this happen? I don't, I don't get it. I don't understand this reasoning. And then as she's reaching into her pocket for a tissue, because she's crying, obviously, Kimmy's necklace falls out of her pocket. Before we get into the revelation of Kimmy's necklace, which Corky's completely forgotten about up to this point, this is just such a sad image. You know, the last two weeks, she's been going to her sister's grave every day just to talk with her. She misses her so much. They're only one year apart, and they've spent their whole lives together. They share a room. They're just BFFs. It's so sad. The whole funeral scene is really sad, too, where the whole Corcoran family is standing together, and, and it talks about just the loss and how they're now one less than they used to be. And, oh... If you get easily saddened by things like this, prepare to actually get emotional reading a Fear Street book. That's kind of nuts, but it happens. Anyway, getting back to that, she finds Kimmy's necklace. She's like, oh my god, Kimmy was present at my sister's death prior to me getting there. She's got to know something more that she's not telling anyone. So Corky drives to Kimmy's, who's actually hanging out with Deborah and Ronnie at the time, and she pulls out this necklace and says, I know you killed my sister, I know you killed my sister, and all three girls are just staring at her like, you need to calm down, it's okay. And Corky says, this was your necklace? I found it at the scene. There's only one possible explanation. And Kimmy says, that's not my necklace. I gave it to Jennifer a month ago. And yes, she resented Bobby and was jealous of her, but would never murder her. Corky says that it makes no sense for Jennifer to have even been in the locker room because she doesn't change in the locker room. Yeah, she obviously doesn't need to take a shower there. She didn't get sweaty during practice and she needs help changing anyway. So yeah, that wouldn't have happened. Now, it's even more damn that that necklace was there because shit if it was Kimmy's necklace she could have dropped it there at any time and maybe nobody noticed if it's Jennifer's necklace what the frick is Jennifer doing freaking wheeling her wheelchair into this room where somebody's freaking dying what's going on well Corky's on a mission so she's rushing out of Kimmy's room as all the girls are saying wait no come back she is on her way to Jennifer's but as she's pulling up on that street she sees a car leaving Jennifer's house and Corky sees that is Jennifer driving the car and she's just wondering how can Jennifer be driving the car if she's paralyzed? They didn't get one of those special cars for people who are paralyzed to drive. Yeah, and now she's even more mad and more certain that Jennifer is freaking responsible for this whole bullshit. She follows her all the way to the cemetery. Jennifer's going to the cemetery. She steps out of her car and she walks up onto the grass and Corky sort of sneaks behind and follows her. She sees Jennifer. She's wearing her cheerleading outfit and cheerleading pennant and she's freaking dancing. She's dancing around Sarah Fear's grave. Corky has had enough. She just runs up and confronts Jennifer. What else can Corky do at this point in time, right? She's followed her all the way to the cemetery. Crazy as it is that she's driving a car and she's walking without a wheelchair. Now she's freaking dancing around grave in a cheerleading outfit? This is completely nuts. Unfortunately for Corky, Jennifer responds except it's not Jennifer's voice. It's this deep husky voice. And she says she's not actually Jennifer. It turns out Jennifer died weeks ago and she's just a spirit that's inhabiting Jennifer's body. She's actually the spirit of Sarah Fear. It was a spirit that was also trapped in Sarah Fear and when Sarah Fear was buried, the spirit was buried with Sarah Fear. What? So the Really? She was dead that night in the rain. She died on top of Sarah Fear's grave. I waited so long. So long, the husky voice said, deepening with sudden sadness. I waited so long. And then Jennifer came along. Buried for so long, the voice continued. Buried down there for a hundred years with Sarah Fear. So that means the spirit is not Sarah Fear. That's, I guess, one way of looking at it. That's how I interpreted it. Interesting. Now this is the spirit's opportunity to inhabit a new body. The spirit takes that opportunity. If you guys recall, back at the beginning, when we mentioned paramedics thought Jennifer was dead and so did Bobby. Everybody thought she was dead and all of a sudden Bobby sees her blink and take a breath. Turns out that that was a fake blink and a fake breath. The body was dead but the spirit was making it do that. Now, Corky's kind of like, maybe even like kind of backing away, but it's too late because now the spirit is calling up its spirit powers and just giant whirlwind of dirt 
forms a tornado around them and just starts swirling all around, creates like this wall of flying dirt. Impassable. Quirky can't get out. The heavy funnel of dirt from the grave continued to swirl silently around the two girls, blacking out all sound, all light, all evidence that the rest of the world existed. Yeah, so that sounds pretty messed up. Quirky does actually try to escape, but... She can't, so now she's forced to come face to face with basically Jennifer's dead body possessed by an evil spirit. Kimmy, Deborah, and Ronnie actually show up, but because of that dirt tornado, they can't get to Corky. And even Jennifer, well, Sarah Fear, evil spirit Jennifer, says, your friends are too late, they can't save you, it's time for you to die. Kimmy, Deborah, and Ronnie are there just helpless, witnessing what's unfolding. So now we have the possessed Jennifer, who is inhabited by the Seraphir evil spirit and she's trying to actually bury Corky alive continuing on her mad quest to kill off all of the perceived enemies of Jennifer which doesn't even make any sense but apparently this is like what the evil spirit does this is actually a callback to secret bedroom where that spirit once possessing the human being starts to take on the enemies list and decide like oh yeah I'm gonna do you a favor except not a favor because it's completely not So she's going to try to bury Corky alive with Seraphir's skeleton. With another wave of Jennifer's hand, more dirt flew up into the swirling dirt funnel. As the dirt rose up in eerie silence, Corky stared down into a deep hole. To her horror, the hole revealed the top of a coffin, the dark wood swollen and warped. See your new home and your new friend, the evil spirit cried in its hoarse, dead voice. Oh, Corky moaned weakly as the coffin lid creaked open. Still compelled to peer down into the darkness, Corky watched the lid lift all the way up. Inside the coffin, she saw a rotting skeleton, its eyeless skull staring up at her with a toothy grin. The skeleton was moving, quivering all over. No, staring hard, unable to remove her eyes from the ghastly sight, Corky saw why the skeleton appeared to quiver. Those were worms moving on the bones, thousands of white worms slithering over the skeleton, crawling over the rotten remains of Sarah Fear. So when I first read that passage, I kind of thought to myself, like, wait a second, this body's been buried for like a hundred years. Surely the bones must have been picked clean by now. But then I thought about it and look at Jennifer's body, right? She's been dead for weeks and weeks and she still looks like she's alive and kicking. So it must have been that while the evil spirit was possessing that body, it didn't decompose at all. She must have been essentially buried alive, except not buried alive. She was buried undead, which is really weird, right? If she was buried undead dead couldn't she force her way out use her magic to like dig herself out it's almost like a strange thing here but whatever the case may be once the spirit left that body and transferred to jennifer then it would have started to decompose and now we're seeing four weeks later however long it is yeah of course there's gonna be worms all over the thing well this is the point where kimmy deborah and ronnie show up but the evil spirit says you know what your friends are here but it's too late to save you she shoves Corky into the open grave. Corky uses her cheerleading skills, and we all know she's a star cheerleader. Basically, she does this thing where she is able to, like, kind of bounce back. I guess she rolls with the fall, does a parkour move, uses the momentum to, like, bounce back out. I'm picturing her doing, like, a sweet backflip while she's doing it, too. Anyway, she grabs onto the edge of the grave, vaults herself up out of it, and now she's back on the ground. Jennifer doesn't see this coming. I think she's probably already turned around, like, ha ha ha, I was Yeah, she's facing down Kimmy, Deborah, and Ronnie. Corky is still on the warpath, like she's been for the last few pages. Just mad as heck about her sister getting murdered, so she just goes all out, just like war cry, "Ah!" and just tackles Jennifer down to the ground. She actually tries to throw her back into the grave, cast that evil spirit back to the chasm from whence it came, so to speak. So then Jennifer opens her mouth and... Jennifer turned to face her, her eyes wild with fury. She opened her mouth wider, wider, and a wind blew out, a stench, a vapor, a wind that howled over Corky, covered her face, filled her nostrils. Jennifer tilted her head, closed her eyes, and the vapor roared out of her, reeking of death, of decay, of all that is foul. It blew into Corky's face, hot and wet and sour. Corky gagged and turned her face, but the wind still howled out of Jennifer's mouth, encircled Corky, and choked her in its thick, hot stench. I'm going to suffocate, she thought. I can't breathe. I'm going to suffocate. The smell. The smell is too sickening. So Corky almost gives in, but she thinks about her sister Bobby. 
And this gives her strength to keep fighting. She grabs Jennifer by the throat and forces her to breathe that stench into the grave itself. And it turns out that that stench that she's breathing out, this is actually her channeling her spirit energy. All of that is directed back into the grave and she ends up getting stuck back inside the coffin from where she came to begin with. And then Corky slams that coffin shot because she is not dealing with that anymore. And then now Jennifer's body actually starts to decompose bows pretty rapidly. As the girls gaped in silent horror, Jennifer's skin dried and crumpled, flaking off in chunks. Her long hair fell off, strands blowing away in the breeze. Her eyes sank back into her skull, then rotted into dark pits. Her cheerleading costume appeared to grow larger as her flesh decayed underneath it, and her bones appeared. R.I.P. Jennifer, we got two cheerleaders down. Surprise, surprise, we got two uniformed officers arriving on the scene immediately. Two young officers, by the way. You guys know we're going to harp on this later. Obviously, all the girls are taken to the police station because they're standing next to a recently exhumed-looking grave and a dead body. At the very least, there were grave robbing. At worst, it might be murder. They all give their statements. Corky must have been interrogated a bajillion times, but at the end of the day, they just chalk it up to good old Fear Street. At it again. Fear Street, one of the policemen had said grimly, shaking his head. Fear Street. So they finally let Corky go at 3 a.m. in the morning. Well, the thing is, Jennifer's parents are also there, and they're kind of confused because the police are telling them, your daughter's been dead for weeks, just look at the body. And obviously, they've had Jennifer in their house for weeks. They want answers, and there were no reasonable answers. No logical answers. Which, obviously... Yeah, I mean, the coroner's report's gonna be like, oh yeah, she died hitting a gravestone, getting thrown out of a bus, and then she was decomposing for a couple months. What were you guys doing with a decomposing girl in your house this whole time. But the thing is, there are witnesses in the school because the entire school saw her wheel herself up during that assembly. And obviously, they have the report from the hospital, so... And then the witness statement's like, yeah, she drove herself to the cemetery. Everybody at the school saw her in a wheelchair. Corky finally leaves the station at 3 a.m. She thinks she's finally done with all of this bullshit. She's still really sad about Bobby, and she's talking to Bobby Spears, saying, I wish you were here with me, but she goes into bed. She pulls up the covers, but there's something in the bed with her, and... It's Jennifer's pennant. Then it fell from her hand, and she started to scream. And that's the end of the book. So, nitpicks. There aren't enough funds for all the girls to be on the squad? Okay, but then, the alternate still gets a uniform. Also, they have enough to buy a completely new set of uniforms when the first set gets ruined in the rainstorm after the bus crash. I would think that these are probably like the primary expense. Aside from maybe liability insurance. But if you're paying out liability insurance, then the alternate is still going to the practices and going to all the events. She would have to be covered anyway. Guys, if you've ever been on a cheerleading squad or run a cheerleading squad as a staff or faculty advisor, hit us up in the comments. Does this make any sense to you? Because it doesn't make any sense to me. And Maybe I'm missing something here, but I think it's a little fishy. Well, I'm definitely missing something with Simmons and his bus driving. When they got in the accident he was looking out the door of the bus which is as everyone who's ridden a bus knows on the side because his windshield you know in the front were all steamed up (laughs) i'm sorry but who looks out their side windows when they drive (laughs) can you just put on the defogger Yeah, I think based on his description, I'm going to assume that his brain was a little bit fogged up at that moment. It may have seemed a little bit like a good idea to him under the influence of whatever steamy substance he was on. But he's still the bus driver after, like, in any real place, he would have gotten fired because the cheerleader died because the door was open and he was speeding on a wet road. Actually, that's funny, right? Okay, so it's not funny that a cheerleader died, but it's an interesting coincidence because that was his fault. Then, you go back earlier, there was an incident right at the beginning of the book where Kimmy tries to take a shower, but the water's way too hot, and she has trouble turning it off. So she files a complaint and puts in, like, a request to get it fixed. Well, guess what? Simmons is also, like, the repairman for the girls' locker room or whatever. And they all go like, oh yeah, like, that's never gonna get done. He's so unreliable. Later on, as you know, Bobby gets killed by the showers all going on and not being able to turn off. That's attributed to witchcraft or the evil spirit, but let's say I'm 
I'm Scully and you're Mulder, right? And we're FBI agents investigating this. As Scully, I'm going to go like, well, it was Simmons, right? He's just completely incompetent. A, he killed that one girl in the bus crash. And B, he killed the other girl because he can fix that shit in time. And then he covered it all up by making it look like a weird, like, haunting. At the end, like, they take his mask off or something and the dog goes, woof. My other nitpick is, so Jennifer is paralyzed from the waist down. But she's somehow back in school in two weeks. I get that she's possessed by the evil spirit of Sarah Fear or some other evil spirit. But that timeline of recovery is way too fast that any doctor would be okay with. Well, I think she had the school spirit to make it back in time for the pep rally. Do you have any other nitpicks? <laughs> nah, I think we got it covered. You want to move on to the mythos? We've got a few callbacks. Lisa Bloom is the person that tells Corky that all the houses on Fear Street are haunted. Yeah, which is funny because there's actually a character in the original book that we saw Lisa in who kept telling everybody all about Fear Street. You mean Corey, her uh, ex-boyfriend? Well, who's Corey? I think, wasn't it his friend that was even more into it? Yeah, Corey was really into that stuff too, so I guess she's kind of caught on with that. And then we got Carrie Taylor. She actually talks to Bobby after Bobby is named cheer captain. She just goes, oh, hi, nice to meet you. I'm so happy for you. And that's about it. Yeah, which one's Carrie again? Party Summer. Party Summer! Oh my god, that's like the second book in a row she's been in. Correct. Interesting. All right, so... You're... I know that you spent a long time on the mythos in particular, so let's get into that. Okay, so those of you who made it all the way to the mythos section of our previous episode, I know, I know, the in-depth plot was a long slog, but it was worth it, believe me. Those of you who did that and made it that far know that we actually had a little bit of a breakthrough on the entire mythos theorizing. We actually came to realize that the corporation may have actually instigated the entire missing incident with the cult and that all of those glowing green monkey skulls were definitely composed of the Fear Street clay mineral. The effects would have been amplified due to those cult members carrying these large chunks of the active mineral substance around with them at all times and that would have probably precipitated that whole event. Now, that really got me thinking when I read this book at first my thought is like oh yeah ghost possession again this is definitely the secret bedroom angle we're gonna go for that but then i started thinking about the whole sarah fear thing and this is starting to tie back into the old mythos the fear mythos For example, this is the side of the mythos that was opened up during Party Summer, where we had Simon Fear relate the legend of the old Simon Fear who originally founded Fear Mansion, and Anna and I believe began digging for the clay mineral and experimenting on its effects. And so now we have to come to Sarah Fear. This is the really big question here. What caused her to become possessed by an evil spirit? Or perhaps become evil herself and actually make her own spirit evil and immortal in some way? Did she murder the other four people in the graves buried behind her? They all had gravestones marked with the exact same day. Maybe it was like a weird suicide pact which powered that spirit's long life under the earth. Maybe it was like a weird macabre sacrifice, human sacrifice ritual, which was used to kind of feed off of their souls. All of this somehow has to tie back into Simon Fear's original experiments, which eventually led to the death of his family and his house burning down in mysterious hell flames. So now we have to contend with the fact that the original Simon Fear, his legacy can still be felt on Fear Street. It's still going strong. It survives through evil spirits like Sarah Fear, and it lives on in his descendants, like Simon Fear the Younger, who nearly murdered some young residents of Shady Side on their vacation. They are as much a part of this mythos as this corporation. And so now you're trying to look at the whole big picture and you're seeing that there are opposing forces at play here. You have the corporation that's experimenting on the town folk, either already has or is in the process of getting all the mineral rights and completely taking over Shady Side. They can't afford a big public scare or exposure as it would get them shut down. The government would not be able to stand by them at that point. However, this ties into the fact that we think they're getting cooperation from at least some faction of the government and probably needs to provide a military or defense application in return for that cooperation and that cover. The other faction I just mentioned is the Fears. Simon Fears' experiments probably were the first to unlock the true potential of the mineral and to be exploited for human greed and gain. And what we see in this book may be a side effect of, or even a purposeful part of this experimentation. I predict that we have yet to 
see the full extent of what he and or they, the fears, were able to accomplish. I think their continued presence is almost certainly going to be a thorn in the side of the corporation and something that the corporation will closely monitor as it is a wild card that could play a role in sabotaging their plans. Again, like I mentioned earlier, they can't risk public exposure. Not being able to fully contain or control all of the cards in play puts them at risk of exposure. Finally, I believe there is probably a third faction that is yet to be fully revealed. This is the naturally occurring phenomena that are caused by the presence of the mineral in Shadyside over the millennia upon millennia that mineral has been under the ground there. And so over time, the natural landscape around Shadyside would have evolved and adapted to the presence of the mineral deposits and their effects. This is just simple biology and evolution at play here, folks. And I think that this is inevitable. How this will come to play into future stories, we have yet to see, but I can't wait to find out. So going along with what you're saying with the three opposing forces, I think that Simmons is actually a force of chaos that's thrown in. I think he was maybe sent in by a rival corporation to uncover all the fear stuff going on, and that's why he's terrible at both his jobs as both a bus driver and a custodian. And at the same time, I think he orchestrated the whole bus crash and in fact wanted to see what would happen if someone died in the cemetery like that because they knew about the possession. And that's why he always has those headphones glued to his head because the other corporation doesn't know how this corporation is doing their work. It could be through sounds because we know based on the one of the Dielatov past theories that infrasound can actually change human behavior. So by wearing those headphones, you know, we don't know what kind of headphones they are. It could be just a protective measure to prevent the corporation from stopping his agenda. That's a really good theory. The other thing you have to consider here is that he could have had outside help. Remember, all the windows were fogged up. All he has to do is crash the bus and make sure that Jennifer gets ejected from the bus. People outside can then drag her unconscious body, knock her head against the gravestone, and run away. You don't have to even imagine that he is somehow some kind of like crazy stunt driver or anything. All he has to do is make sure she gets thrown out. Everything else will be taken care of. Nobody's gonna see a thing. Also, I was thinking along the lines of, you were wondering how come if the spirit was so powerful within Jennifer, she could do so many things, how come when she was buried, like how could she be buried in there? And I'm thinking that is probably one of the properties of the mineral deposits, of the blue clay, where when they are free amongst us, they have all their power, but once they're within that blue clay, it sort of traps their abilities within them, and they need to be able to be outside the coffin in order to do the sand tornadoes. Whoa, that actually kind of makes sense. One thing I noticed in this book is that the Cocorans, they both think that the kids are snobs because they're worried that no one's wanting to become friends with them, and there's just something weird and uptight about Shady Side kids. They always seem to be so clicky, and maybe it's because kids in Shady Side they don't want to associate with new kids because they always are harbingers of evil. Something bad always happens with new kids, whether it's to the new kids or people who have associated with the new kids. That's an interesting thought. By the way, guys, we're not going to disappoint you. Let's talk about the quick police response times. And the young officers. So we got young officers responding incredibly quickly to both Jennifer getting killed and later (coughs) resuscitating (coughs) miraculously, and also to Jennifer finally getting kill-killed and Seraphir's evil spirit possession thingy getting shoved back into the earth. Both cases, lightning fast response. And we're supposed to believe, as Hannah mentioned earlier, we're supposed to believe that somehow people phoned it in as if the neighborhood around the Fear Street Cemetery is so well populated. Full of empty houses is how it's always described. Exactly. And we also can't forget how quick the paramedics were in responding to Kimmy's accident during the cheerleader practice. Oh yeah. I mean, we've already discussed the importance of Shadyside High to the whole mythos. And it makes sense that as soon as there's that 911 call, they would be at that school immediately. That ties right into the whole school linkage. The other thing is, we did hear a little bit 
bit of howling, I believe. You guys probably think this is a stretch at this point, but we're going to try to keep harping on that Guardians of Fear Street theory. And that probably ties into that third force, don't you think? The naturally occurring phenomena? Could be, right? Yeah, it's possible. It's been a while since we saw them. Interestingly enough, the last time we saw the Guardians of Fear Street was in Missing. Huh. There you go. The book that I finally realized many, many volumes after having actually read it is the key to unraveling this whole thing. This book is like the capstone to the whole theory. We got ourselves a doorway. Well, let's walk through it right into 90s things. Hey, all right. So I thought that the bus driver looks just like the bus driver from the Simpsons cartoon. Which is a cartoon from the 90s. Yes, Otto. And also, Jennifer is compared to... Julia Roberts. Who is very much a 90s star, I think. That's true, yeah. She starred in all the big 90s rom-coms. Yeah, those are pretty much all we could come up with. I actually put jeans on the outline, like blue jeans. And then Anna was like, that's dumb. That's not a 90s thing. And yeah, I don't know what I was thinking. I didn't say that's dumb. I said, people wear jeans now. What are you talking about? People have been wearing jeans since like the 1800s. I guess you saw them in the 90s and decided they were 90s things. What were your thoughts on the book? I thought the cheerleading chants didn't work because I felt the cadences didn't work. Yeah, so we need to know, did Arl Stein actually get these, like, from his local high school, or did he try to make them up on his own and just fail hard? The question begs to be asked. I did think it was cool how he had a lot of cheerleading moves in this book, and I did Google them, and they are real things, so he did a minimal amount of research into cheerleading routines. He probably picked up, like, a cheerleading for dummies book or something. One thing I wanted to mention about this book, in the first chapter title is the evil sister. In this case, Bobby is the evil Kerkoran sister because she's the one that plots to stick the fake rat under Sean's door. And Corky's first line is, you're so evil. That was an interesting idea because I don't know if it was when he first started writing, maybe he was doing like a one draft thing. I sometimes suspect him of doing a one draft thing. And he initially thought as he was writing the beginning of the book, maybe he wanted to make Bobby a red herring. That's why he made that chapter title and made her seem to be sort of evil. But then she's never portrayed as being anything even remotely close to evil anywhere in the rest of the book. I don't know. I'm not sure where he was going with that. It was almost like an abortive foreshadowing or or something, but it was a curious note that he struck and it just stuck with me. Actually, it's funny that it stuck with me for this long because if you guys don't know, this is actually the longest we've gone from reading the actual book until recording. It's been over a week since I read this book and for some reason I've been pondering on this this whole time and As far as thoughts on the book go, that's something. The book actually gives me something to think about and mull over. I actually really like this book. Well, I wanted to make a note. Remember how during my predictions, I basically used a Buffy episode? Yeah, I do remember that. Well, a cool Buffy thing is the first evil is actually something in Buffy. So the first evil is the source and embodiment of all that is evil. It's a power, older than the written word, than the Big Bang, and transcends all realities and dimensions. It is older than any other evil being and may even be the first entity ever to have existed. Whoa. So I just thought that was interesting tie with Buffy. That is an interesting. So is the that evil spirit that's possessing Sarah Fear, does that mean that she like was able to summon in the first evil in like a weird pentagram ritual her four other people are buried there think about it in the book that we just reviewed meddling kids for every ritual and spell that had to be cast it required a pentagram to be drawn and five wizards to participate basically these are like really powerful spells we're talking about like an ordinary spell obviously we see wizards doing spells by themselves all the time alohomora or whatever right but like these are super duper summon a world ending Cthulhu. Yeah, Cthulhu. Not actually Cthulhu, but no spoilers here. If you want to summon literally the first evil, a primordial creature that has been around since before the Big Bang, yeah, you're probably gonna have to do that whole pentagram five wizard thing. And guess what? How many bodies do we have buried in Fear Street Cemetery? Interesting how this ties in with the other book we reviewed. Completely unintentional. It just happened that way. But I think it's cool. When you were reading this book, did you think it was a possession thing? No, I thought it was a witchcraft thing. And I kind of suspected Jennifer. Just because she did also have that thought at the beginning where she like seemed a little bit jealous but in the rest of the book she seemed really nice until you know you broadcast that it was her when bobby catches her walking around the house 
Yeah, I don't know. I kind of figured everybody else was a red herring. Yeah, I thought it was Jennifer too. And I did catch the thing with her being a little jealous in the beginning, but I did notice her reactions every time Bobby mentioned Chip as well. Yeah, definitely. You could kind of see it coming, but I don't think anybody saw the whole possession thing. That was nuts. Although, for those of you who are paying attention to the book while reading it, he actually drops the hint right at the very beginning. When Jennifer first dies? That's right, yeah. It's made very clear that she's dead, but then she like somehow opens her eyes and starts breathing that was like a hint and that bothered you i remember you were telling me when you were reading the book like oh these paramedics what are they doing I could get the shady side high kids not realizing that someone was actually alive when they call the person dead but paramedics are actually trained so I was so confused how can they say that she's dead when she's actually alive that was actually the big hint that it's possession it was right there for all of us to read props to R.L. Stein for putting this big thing right out there for everyone to see and then just going like oh yeah you're not gonna see it you're not I thought this book was pretty fun. How many scalding hot showers would you give this book? Don't make me flash back to that scene. That was awful. I'm really struggling here. I kind of want to give it a three. Why don't I hear your rating first? Because I feel like I went first last time. How many scalding hot showers did you give this book? I didn't like how he described the characters. I felt that was like really weird. Oh, the sexism, right. But in terms of everything else, I mean, I do think he did a decent job setting it up. I don't think he's killed one of the main narrators before. And I like that. I liked the family. He built up that family so well just to tear them apart. That was devastating. But it has the whole Fear Street writing style that you don't really get to really dive deep into that family. But you do get to see Corky afterwards and she is just devastated and I do like that. I think he did a good job building up the characters. We always talk about how he doesn't do a good enough job and with Corky and Bobby, he did fine. I mean, we do have two cheerleaders that sort of just exist to be there and I guess that's okay. Yeah, maybe they'll have a bigger role in next book. We'll find out. I don't know. I think he did a decent job. The cheers were awful, but (laughs) he's not a cheerleader, so. I think that since I'm grading on a Fear Street scale, I'd give it a 3.25 out of 5 rounds to 3. I guess I would have to give this book a 2.75. The reason being is that I definitely like it better than Best Friend. Just sitting here, I find myself struggling to remember some aspects of Best Friend and some of the things I thought about it. I find that a lot of aspects of this book are really sticking with me. So I guess it just speaks to me more. I can relate. 2.75 rounds to 3? That's correct. I'm definitely interested to read the next cheerleader books and I think that this book was a good introduction to the series. I think the whole family dynamic of the Kirkwood family like is what really hooked me and just the heartbreak of losing a daughter like that that was really awful and i thought that was pretty real so let's make some predictions for fear street second evil fear street cheerleaders the second evil cheers from the grave (laughs) once again we have three cheerleaders on the cover they're holding their pom-poms and once again we have one cheerleader up front and center and then two cheerleaders in the back the two cheerleaders in the back actually look like they could be the same girls but the cheerleader in the front definitely looks different and she's sort of side-eyeing you it's a side profile she's turned at you and she's just sort of judging you with her eyes huh so this is gonna play back into the whole pentagram thing we busted out right at the end there don't you think so anna yes we're looking at this two covers so the second one has like a three-quarter view of a cheerleader versus the first one has a frontal view head-on of a cheerleader and so i think this is signifying the approach of the evil right the one is the frontal assault taking one of their own and taking down the cheerleading squad head on now this other approach is going to be kind of from the side and what i'm thinking here is that there's definitely going to be some witchcraft involved i mean it says as much in the back we're definitely going to see a pentagram drawn on a floor somewhere and i'm thinking we're going to get a bigger involvement from the whole boyfriend factor i'm kind of seeing that i think we are going to see some involvement of a male here now uh do i want to say it's gonna be a male victim yeah why not let's just go for a male victim and a female murderer we're gonna say that the weapon is going to be fire all right and there's definitely going to be witchcraft involved 
I too agree that it's going to be a witchcraft heavy book because I'm going to stick with my old predictions. Witchcraft. But I think there's going to be possession. I think we're going to see Sarah Fear or one of her compadres. So I think we're going to see a spirit again. I think it's going to be a female murderer, but I'm not going to say if the murderer is the spirit or a person. And I'm going to say it's a female victim. The murder weapon is due to something supernatural. It would be some sort of suffocation. Predictions locked and loaded. This was a really exciting episode. We're so happy to have you with us here once again. And don't forget to check out our giveaways if you're listening to this in the month of October of 2017. That's right. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. Bye. Thanks for listening to another thrilling episode of Rhett Read Podcast. If you like what you hear, give us a shout out. If not, let us know why in the comments. Don't forget to rate, review, comment, share, like, and subscribe. You can follow us at Red Read Podcast on Twitter and Facebook. Or send suggestions or fan mail to red.read.podcast at gmail.com. Until next time, peace!